95, maybe 99, I don't know, a high percentage of Marxists, if you said we should include animals, non-human animals, in the political pantheon of those who are entitled to a, a, a freedom, a political freedom, a social freedom, an emotional freedom, they would laugh. They would say that's a joke. So I sort of constructed the book in a way to say, look, you think it's a joke. One of the things that this archive is meant to demonstrate as it accumulates century after century, continent after continent, political party after political party is one of the fundamentals of human reality has been the presence of non-human animals and the way that we imagine and intercept them and deal with them as members of our community. Good morning, Lee Claire. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Well, it's brilliant to get the chance to talk to you. You were gracious enough to send me a copy of your amazing book, Marks for Cats, which I found a mind-blowing and enjoyable read. And we can dig into some of the themes here because a lot of our themes that we like to cover in these conversations about value and who matters and what matters run richly through your thinking, your work. And as we've discussed briefly, I guess this is a series of conversations about some of the deepest philosophical questions, questions like what's real and how should we best understand the, this crazy universe and questions of epistemology and questions just as importantly of ethics, uh, critically who gets to matter in our moral consideration. And I have an obvious bias because as I've explained, I'm trying to popularise and develop this really pluralistic, broad worldview called sentientism, which answers those questions with evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So it suggests that we should engage honestly with reality in a humble attempt to understand it, and that whatever moral system or ethical system we choose to apply, every sentient being, any being that can experience things, that can value themselves and their lives, should matter seriously in our moral consideration. But I'm lucky in these conversations to talk to a dazzling array of people, some of whom agree, some of whom don't. So it'll be interesting to understand your own philosophical journey, how that plays through your own thinking and how it runs through Marks for Cats too. But before we get on to those big philosophical questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your work for people who haven't come across you so far? Well, so my name is Lee Claire Laberge. I go by my first and middle names I'm from the southern part of the United States. It's quite common there to have a first and middle name, but almost nowhere else in the United States. And I'm a professor. I'm a professor of English at the City University of New York. Uh, English is a quite sort of capacious academic discipline. So in an English department, you don't just find people who read novels or who write novels or study poetry or theater or drama, uh, but also who do philosophy, critical theory, probably the most common place in American universities to find people studying European philosophy and European critical theory is in English and comparative literature departments. Um, so even though I am a professor of English and I have written about novels, my my real academic interests are in the sort of relationship between economic forms and the constitution of reality. And I'm particularly interested in the way that different cultural objects, be they artworks or films or television shows or novels mediate between what we perceive as economically real and what might be economically possible. So economics has been a huge part of my intellectual development, but somewhat surprisingly so. When I first, I was a philosophy major in college. When I first got out of college, I worked for a year and a half or so with a management consulting firm in Midtown Manhattan in New York City. Um, and I, I sort of got to see what corporate accounting and corporate profiteering and, and corporate record keeping is about. And I, I was genuinely surprised. And I, I really thought, like, this cannot be the way that capitalism works. But it is. It is the way that capitalism works. And that is what actually motivated me to start thinking about and, and wanting to study political economy, which is basically a sort of manifestly politicized understanding of economic forms and economic structures. Uh, the first book I wrote as, a, as an English professor is called Scandals and Abstraction. Um, and it was about 
financial scandals in the 1980s in the corporate world and how involved literature and film were in representing what those scandals were, not only to people who were not part of the scandals, like newsreaders or, you know, sort of everyday people who are interested in current affairs, but how how much, in fact, for business people themselves, their understanding of what they're doing has been shaped by novels, films, television shows, so on and so forth. I've also written about contemporary art. I wrote a book called Wages Against Artwork, which looked at a very contemporary sort of artists who engage in the economy and who see art as a site to either produce or reflect a more equitable economy. And in one of those chapters in that book, Wages Against Artwork, I wrote about animals and art and and the way that animals have been recruited into contemporary artworks. So for instance, oftentimes, not so much now, but maybe five or six years ago, you know, you would walk into a gallery in Chelsea in New York City, and the gallery would just be filled with, with live birds flying around. Uh, and the birds and their flight were taken to be the piece, the artwork, that you would be in the presence of animals and birds. And so that really got me thinking about animals. And through that first exercise of really thinking about what kind of participants animals could be in economic artwork, I started thinking about how animals could be present just in the economy. I mean, how they, how they already are present in the economy. And my, my partner is, in fact, an artist. And she said to me, she said, Artists need help learning how to use critical terms of economics, whether it's labor or value or alienation or abstraction or finance. She said, what if you made a series of of videos about these economic terms for artists? And I said, I just can't do it. It's just too boring. I can't hear myself talk anymore. (laughs) And she said, but what if you weren't talking to students or artists? What if you were talking to cats? And Genius idea. What a, what a revelation. I mean, we made this series of videos called Marks for Cats. People can find it actually today at marksforcats.com, where I do explain these basic terms of Marxism to cats. Um, and the cats loved it. I mean, they went crazy for it. And it was also just so much fun getting to work with with animals in a in a sort of different capacity and trying to take them seriously as interlocutors. And that gave birth to this book, A Marks for Cats, which is essentially a history of the capitalist world system, the capitalist economy, as told through cats, with cats, and for cats. It was just published last year, 2023, by Duke University Press. And I've been really lucky to be able to talk to so many different interlocutors about the book. And I'm I'm really glad to be joined by you today. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, bef- and we'll come on to some of the themes in Marks for Cats later on. But what is it about cats that you think provides a interesting lens on this question of political economy and its history? Is it just a sort of random, interesting confluence? Yes. I mean, it's a great, you know, it's a great question. As you can imagine, it's one that I'm often asked. I think when when it when the project started, I mean, I I grew up with cats and I I love cats and I I had a cat, my last cat passed in 2016. But yeah, I'm I'm genuinely or I genuinely was, I'm not sure if I still am, but I genuinely was a cat person. But cats are also amazing anti-work creatures or amazing anti-authoritarian creatures. And I didn't I didn't know this before I started the research for the book. I mean, I had a sort of hunch, a sort of suspicion. But as I show in the book, you know, cats have been understood to be anti-authority for at least 1,200 years. And throughout the entire rise of of capitalism, let's say from about oh, late, late 16th, the early 17th century to the present, all forms of cats have been included or understood as economic creatures, whether it's, you know, you're talking to you today in London. I think of the association of the British royal family and the lion. I mean, that is an association that's honestly over a thousand years old. Uh, or of the 
the sabotabi, the sabotage cat, you know, the black anarchist cat who sows chaos or the wild cat and the wild cat stripe. So I think cats, cats have been positioned for quite a while historically as economic creatures. Again, I had a suspicion of that, but the research that I did in the book really, really sort of bore it out and really showed how, how diverse cats are as economic actors. Yeah, and as symbols of and rep- and how they're used in different forms of representation. And I started the book wondering if you might, you know, almost struggle. You might have reaching for examples, and it just wasn't the case, right? They just they pop up everywhere. It's so the resonant. opposite yeah. was true. Yeah, the book could have it could have gone on, and and you know, a question I I also often get asked is when I was doing this research. Did other animals populate this historical archive? Could you do this project with other animals? And you could. You could do it with with dogs, with horses, with birds even. You would want to try to look for animals that could both be companion animals and work animals, because that's really what's so interesting about capitalism as an economic system, right? That it both structures our external reality and our most intimate, internal and sort of familial realities. But The thing that is, I think, quite unique about cats is that even before the rise of capitalism, you know, even in the feudal era, going back to the the 12th century, cats were already understood as anti-authoritarian creatures. You know, I talk about the medieval witch and her familiars. Those were the animals who accompanied her. I mean, the black cat was was always, always there. So, I mean, so were other animals, the frog and the rabbit. And those have sort of dropped out of history's menagerie, but the cat has maintained its, its, its critical and its anti-authoritarian power. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let me pull you back to the first of our deep philosophical questions I ask all my guests. And I guess in a simple terms, it's, it's what's real or more broadly, how do we work out what's real? And that question can cover the entire scope of possible belief, but quite often an interesting way into it is to understand from a guest their journey with respect to religion or the spiritual and whether they grew up originally with a more supernatural or religious worldview or one that was maybe more naturalistic, maybe atheistic, agnostic, and how that side of their thinking has changed over time, if it has. You know, the big questions of the nature of our universe and how best to understand it, whether that's faith revelation or evidence and reason or something else. So yeah, you can wind the clock back to sort of tell your story on that as much as you like. Sure. I mean, I grew up nominally Presbyterian, but with with no sense of of familial attachment to a church. My father was a very lapsed Catholic. So if he had had anything antagonism towards the the Catholic church. But, you know, by the time I was, I don't know, Six or seven, I was. It was clear that it, the church was not going to be for me. Um, that early, but I, yes, yes. But I did grow up. Both of my parents were professors, so I did grow up in a very academic household. The other interesting thing, and I think this probably contributes to a lot of, will contribute to a lot of our discussion today, is I grew up in a very rural part of Virginia, um, and I grew up quite near, I mean, maybe, I don't know, 100 meters from a cow pasture. And, you know, walking to the school bus, getting dropped off from the school bus every day, every time I was outside, I was near or in the presence of cows. The the cow pasture, there was a little fence that the children, neighborhood children always jump. And, you know, in the summer, we would play in the cow pasture I, as a child, I thought we were playing in a creek. As an adult, I realized it wasn't really a creek. It's where the cows went to relieve themselves. But, you know, whatever. We were children. It was, <laughs> we had fun. In the winter, we went there to sled. So I really did grow up in the presence of animals. We had dogs and cats at home. And, you know, even even quite young, this division between like, why are the cows in this fence? And, area by themselves and their their cows and the dogs and cats live with us and are members of our family what what is the sort of what is the cause of this what is what is the root of this and when i was 11 so i guess i was in 6th grade there was a quite dramatic scene that unfolded in this cow pasture which again was like 
you know, I could see from my my window um, a in February. So sort of early in the birthing season, a cow had given birth right near the the fence where the children played and it had been a breech birth and the farmer had had to extract the the calf i don't know what they use chains or i i really don't know but the calf had broken a bone in its leg um and was unable to walk and and as a result the mother had decided to just just leave it to to you know die because it was it was really unable to live in those conditions. And for some reason, the farmer also decided to leave the calf there to, to die. And it, what an appalling scene. I mean, it was cold. It was winter. It was snowing. This calf was this little black calf. It was sort of shivering to death. It couldn't walk. And so a friend and I called a, a local radio station and asked them if they would come do a story about this calf which, of course, upset the farmer. I mean, he said, what did he care? You know, the calf was going to be killed anyway. What did it matter if it died now or then? But the local university had a vet school, and the vet school offered to come take the calf, take it out of the the pasture, bring it to the vet school, give it some kind of surgical remediation, get it walking again. You know, we were in the newspaper. The science teacher who, this is a, sort of a very strange story, turned out to be a pedophile. We didn't know that then, but he brought the calf into the, the middle school, the science classroom, and we sort of superintended and cared for the calf as a collective project uh, for several weeks on end. And the reason I bring up the thing about the pedophile is this is just such an odd story of, you know, of business, of sort of depraved sexual politics, of animal politics, of family politics. But that that experience of taking care of this calf and and seeing it and seeing what its life might have been and what its life could be really changed me. And even though I was not from a household of vegetarians, I did become a vegetarian when I was 11 and I was from a household of readers, and I was from a household of historians. So as an 11-year-old, I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. He was a previous guest, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. And the, this was really, you know, this was, I think, really one of the first times, you know, as a child or, or sort of adolescent, that I was able to sort of break out of the the, the comfort of my my family and 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 start to think about different problems and and ask them to join me in thinking about the problems and it's you know it's been a long journey even with this question of animals because one of the things that my family you know we had my parents would have portraits of our dogs and cats made and place them around the house I mean it was really a household with love for animals but not the ones that you eat and not the ones that lived across the street. Uh, and so this was a, you know, this was a very, I think, ripe and exciting and also, you know, divisive, not in the sense that we fought about it, but maybe individuating is a better is a better term, sort of helped me start to individuate from my family and start to see, okay, you know, I can have different interests. It's not going to be religion. It's not really going to be history, although this book is quite historical, Marks for Cats, but but it is going to be in thinking about who forms our most intimate communities and who do we want to be in our communities and and what would the sort of what would species have to do with it uh, i was lucky to grow up in a university town it was a very small town with a very big university so by the time i was really 12 and 13 i would go to events around you know earth day and animal liberation at the university and yeah, it's, it's, it's been a line of questioning that has taken different forms in my life, you know, sometimes philosophical, sometimes activist, sometimes historical, but one that has really been with me for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. These themes seem to bubble up pretty early in your life. So. Yeah. And back to the, I guess, the question of religion and epistemology, it sounds like the religious 
context of your family was pretty light anyway, so there wasn't really anything for you to rebel against or turn away from. Did it just sort of fade into the background and into irrelevance? Or was there ever a point where you engaged with it, challenged it and rejected it? Or it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't robust enough to reject. Yeah. You know? And I think I think and I think this is probably something that we'll we'll talk about, but you know, the more I think about it, I think that what my parents wanted from a church was less a sense of religious community than just community. So the Presbyterian Church in the 1980s, the Presbyterian Church where I grew up was very active, for instance, in solidarity movements in Central America and anti-apartheid struggles. So it, it wasn't the, it wasn't, I think, the Christian element and the religious element so much as the community element. And in many places and times, that is the only option. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, That's yeah, yeah. It really, it really is true. Yeah. So it, there was no sense of really, you know. I think it's. I think if anything, that the household that I grew up in, you know, my mother was a historian of French medical history, and my father of English Reformation history, was probably defined by a, a sort of genuine secular humanism. I think more than anything else. Yeah. Thank you. And. Um, have you revisited that stuff at any point through your life? Have you ever re-engaged with the religion? Or for many people who don't feel a religious attachment, there's still a sense of maybe a broader spirituality or the transcendent. Or are you like me, a sort of fairly boring, straight down the line, sort of naturalistic evidence and reason, science? And I think I am like you. I, and I, I do feel a sense of loss around that, actually. I do, I do imagine that it would be nice. Um, you know, last year I, I read a book that a, a friend of mine from high school had published, and she herself was was a Mormon. I mean, she was a Mormon in high school. She is still a Mormon. And this is a book that she published after the, you know, quite tragic and unexpected death of her one of her sons. She has four children, or she had four children. And this the the work that this Mormon community did in supporting her through that kind of tragedy. I mean, I'm I'm I was so impressed by that, but there's so many things about that community that I'm also not impressed by, you know? So I yeah, it's I I wish I wish there were more of that. You know, I mentioned to you that I have a full house right now. I and mean, that's why, you know, you might hear or see people. But I do try to live collectively and intergenerationally. Uh right now I live with my partner, my son, and another couple and that's a choice that we have to sort of live together so there there are certainly ways that i really value the sense of a structured community that religion seems to provide i don't so much value the religious yeah the aspect of it so yeah thank you um so before we move off this epistemology question it, it's a theme that runs through i think some of your thinking in your work and certainly you know political theory on the left and Marxism, a, a different approaches to epistemology. And you talk about a dialectic approach in Marx for Cats, which is really interesting. Um, one of the criticisms that's often put to some modes of epistemology on the left and some aspects of what people might think of as postmodernist thinking is that in focusing on a sort of dialectic and a discussion and dialogue and the positionality of those people, it loses connection with reality and risks becoming arbitrary, if you like, and a purely social construct. How do you think about dialectics and an appropriate epistemology for grounding your work in political economy? And mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I both appreciate the question, and it's one of the things that I tried to play with a little bit in the book, Marks for Cat. So your previous question, is the cat just random? Is it like, what about the cat? I mean, that's sort of an acknowledgement of the randomness of some of our epistemological constructs. Um, at the same time, what I have, what I value and I have valued so long, for so long about the the Marxist understanding of forms of knowledge is that they're not random. They're based in our material and our economic structures, you know. And so by developing an understanding of those economic structures, one develops a clear understanding of the confines of our reality, where it comes from and what is able to be changed, right? And so that's, you know, that's the that's the crucial sense of, of dialectics is that as 
you know, as as unchangeable as reality may seem to be at any moment, if one studies history, one realizes how much it has changed, you know, and a, a, a Marxist, a very famous Marxist theorist named Frederick Jameson says, the only unchanging aspect of human nature is the constant change, right? Or something to that effect. I don't have that quote entirely right. But but what dialectics allows us is to to see a reality and to understand how it got to be real and to imagine how it might be otherwise. And that's particularly true for forms of social struggle, right? So that's that's certainly what's guided me. I mean, now, I, as I said, I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate. So I did spend a lot of time thinking about political philosophy, in particular, ancient political philosophy, modern, early modern, and contemporary. And in fact, for me, without the materialist angle, without the economic angle, the conversations that you're able to have as a philosopher did seem to me to be somewhat random and abstract. I mean, they seem to be ethical examples without any necessarily real world consequence or import. So for me, it was really the adding of the economic history and a sort of materialist tone to philosophical questions, I think that's allowed me to arrive at the worldview that I have now. Yeah, thank you. So there is an anchoring in that, you know, external, somewhat objective reality, although our perspectives exactly. are always going to be yes. flawed and different. You know, there probably is a reality out there that we all share that can give us some degree of common grounding that we can work on. But at the same time, to some of the themes in your other work, there's also a recognition of politics and psychology and stories and narratives and how yes. those things can be radically different and can change ra- yes, radically over time. Absolutely. And 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 that's the lesson, you know, of any history is that things change. You know, you don't have to read far in history to get that. But that that can be both a an emancipatory lesson and a frightening lesson, because they don't always change for the better. You know, Jameson, the philosopher I already cited, also has this famous line. He says, history puts its worst foot forward. Uh, So one, you know, this is not necessarily a history of progress as a sort of liberal or enlightenment philosopher would, would have you think. Things get better and they get worse, you know. More freedoms are found, more freedoms are lost. And the dialectical angle is really tries to center the conflict, that that's always a struggle populations, subjects, animals, species, forests, whatever. I mean, they don't just they don't just win rights or are not given rights. It's a struggle to get them and it's a struggle to maintain them. Yeah. And it, and it by definition recognizes that the participants in the dialectic have a distinctive perspective, right? They have different Absolutely. values, different views on reality and that's where that tension and that yeah, comes from. Absolutely. Now what the Marxist what again stress stresses is that out of all of those different and conflicting angles and viewpoints and realities, the the sort of economic one will take precedent or will be a little bit more deterministic, we might say, right? So, you know, in the sense of the story I told, for example, about the animals, you know, the cow that was that was right there, this was such an important philosophical and I think moral lesson for me, but of course it was influenced by the economics. You know, the southern part of the United States is the largest producer of factory farmed animals in the in the country. The particularly, you know, the poor sections of the rural South are completely immersed in these different logics of animal farming and animal husbandry and superintending animal lives. And you know the farmer who said, "Well, what do I care if the if the calf dies? He was going to die anyway. It's a I'm 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 raising these animals to kill them. Like it's you know these are all economic nut logics that were that were guiding us, but that perhaps were not evident at the time. You know. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's come on to the the second of the these big philosophical questions, and you've hinted at some of your answers to it already, but I guess it's about what matters, and it's quite interesting to go on to that from talking to my guests about their epistemological worldview, because my guests who've got a a sort of more religious worldview, the ethics comes as part of the package often, you know, divine command theory, it's obedience to a deity, or it's following the rules in the the book or whatever it is, right? There's a sort of package of ethics that comes along with that. Whereas for people like you and me with a more naturalistic understanding, we we don't have that. So 
morality. What matters for us has to come from somewhere else. Um, and I guess I'm most interested in the, the real foundations of ethics, what really matters at the bottom to people. And so again, it'd be interesting to know your journey, even from, like you're saying, six, seven years old and to now, how you've come to think about what matters and, you know, what the good and bad and right and wrong, what do these things really mean and what's at the root of them? Is it about suffering and well-being, as Peter Singer might talk about, or is it about freedom and autonomy, as others might talk about? Is it about justice and fairness? Or, anyway, I should stop rambling on, but that sort of personal philosophical journey would be interesting to dig through as well. I do think it has changed for me. I mean, I do think I'm probably better able to articulate it now as a as a middle aged academic than I have been at other points in my life. But you know, I I do think that the sense that you get or that I that I have gotten from not only the writings of Marx but but the writings of people in that tradition of social struggle in which there's a shared idea that you know, to each, now we need to define each, but to to each should come a, a potential for self-development. That self-development can take a lot of different forms because people are radically different. Um, but the self-development of one's own sense of a play, joy, creativity, learning, freedom from restraint that would encumber those forms of self-development. For me, what are the things that seem to encumber? Well, again, it's in terms of people and human beings, you know, it's, I think, primarily economic, lack of access to resources, whether that's education or housing or food. Um, so to me, a sense of, you know, providing a space for you know, consistent and unique self-development is crucial. I think it's also crucial to me to be able to do that to animals. And I don't, I don't yet have the language, the vocabulary, the schemes that I think would enable animals to do that. Although I certainly know what would enable them not to do that. Uh, for instance, factory farming, that's not a scene of of self-development for the animals that undergo it. It's also not, I think, a scene of self-development for the humans that undergo it, right? What kind of work do we have? What kind of work do we have access to and for whom? And, you know, I think one thing that has changed, I mean, really, I think as a result of not only the COVID pandemic and realizing the the scale of, of destruction that animal agriculture, that industrial animal agriculture rots. But something that really is a question for me is, okay, at what scale should each of us be thinking of this? Is this a planetary question? Is this a community question, a household question? That I really don't know. I mean, that's something I think that I'm still really pondering and, and conflicted about. Yeah, that's tough. And we'll, we'll come back to that when I ask you the crazily broad question about how we make a better future too. So I will challenge you to, well, we can explore all of those different levels. So it, it feels to me that that idea of self-development is something to do with flourishing and the ability to express our capacities and ability to you know, pursue our own interests. And though, I think those themes are things that we can expand quite radically across you know, the rest of sentientity as well. And the, the freedom and autonomy is an enabler for that flourishing rather than it's being Absolutely. in its own right. It's, it, it's why we would need that. And as you say, maybe the, the questions about the economic structures for non-humans are tougher to work through, but I think those fundamentals carry across quite quite well. Let's come on to the second part of the question, which again, you've already answered a little bit, which is a question about who matters, because I think many people listening to what you've said and talking about self-development and flourishing and freedom would be, you know, yeah, of course, I agree with that too, right? These are essential to my morality. Um, but unfortunately, many humans have a very restricted view of who gets to count as they're thinking about those concepts. So we have plenty of problems where humans restrict that even within the human species. There's in-out group dynamics and polarization and exclusionary ethics, even with their own species. But then, of course, given the powerful hu human supremacy and anthropocentrism of our current society, most people certainly don't extend those considerations in meaningful ways beyond the human species. Although, 
they might do it very selectively for certain companion animals and you know special cases so i don't know if you want to expand any more on your personal journey you talked about when you were 11 years old seeing those scenes and going vegetarian at that point and how do you think about setting moral scope now so i obviously have this bias because i'm focusing on sentience as a way of setting that and saying that any being that has its own interests that can experience anything at all should matter seriously in a moral consideration but yeah so any more about your journey on that front the implications of it and how do you think about moral scope now because some people go beyond as well some people go beyond sentience and animals yeah you know it's 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 funny i mean i i think that for me personally when i think about the scope and the scale of of self development i sort of imagine a community and in 2000 i guess maybe it was 17 um i uh, became a vegan after i had a dream in which my recently deceased cat came to me and was sort of interrogating me about how, how is it that you have this meaningful relationship with me but not with all these other animals the mitten appeared to you in your dream yeah yes um and so i thought okay i'm going to try this i'm going to i'm going to try to be a vegan for a few weeks i'll just see how it goes um and you know it went well but but one of the things that affected me about that decision and and i'm not saying you need to be a vegan to have this or that all vegans have it but for me starting to realize that it enabled me to see other animals whether it was a bird that you know flew by and landed for a minute or or didn't or a squirrel i mean whatever just just animals that i would not have any um interaction with in the sense of a companion animal but that i would see i started to realize i want to think of these animals as part of my community and when i see them i want to acknowledge a scene of reciprocal potential for development for self development and that you know i wouldn't say that was I wouldn't say that was religious. It's not it's not religious for me. But there was a sense of a common spirituality, which I had actually never experienced before in my, you know, few years at church or even with the the scene of the calf dying and and my early years as a vegetarianism. I mean, I think those were really questions about suffering and about politics and morality, but they weren't a sense of like we could be we could have an interspecies community. I mean, we already do, but certain of our species are not acknowledged as the same kinds of community members. Um, so, you know, in my mind, of course, and I think in many people's minds, you know, it's wonderful to imagine a whale, you know, swimming free and people hear, oh my God, a whale got caught up in a, a fishing net. Isn't that horrible? You know, everyone can agree that that's horrible. Right, because few people actually have to see and tussle with and be involved with either commercial fishing or whales. But, but what what do we sense and feel about the animals who are actually in our daily lives? You know, who we might see in a park, we might see at the subway station, we might see in a pet store, we might see on the grocery shelf. How can we expand our sense of community and community flourishing? to include other species the the it's a it's a hard question but the the process of doing so for me has sort of been an amazing creative and intellectual journey um so it's been it's been very motivating for me you know personally yeah i think it's it's quite a deep a very simple but very deep perspective shift that I think is at the core of that, because I think there is a difference between, and I don't know, maybe this is the difference between your 11-year-old self looking out the window at the cow. There's a difference between a reasonably shallow expression of disgust or horror or, or even you know, moral concern with others that is still mostly in our head, and it's more about how we feel than anything else. And it does feel like maybe there is another level you can move beyond where you always imperfectly there is a genuine high integrity attempt to take the perspective of the other and at least imagine in a good faith way what that might be like for them that is genuinely about them and it's not 
quite so much in our heads. I don't know if that makes sense, but that, it's, it's that genuine attempt to take the perspective of the other that feels like a deeper shift for me than just the traditional sentimental, I see an animal that's hurt, I care. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, it's very, it's very easy to be appalled. It's very easy to be outraged. It's very easy to be disgusted even, you know, but what, what kind of community do we live in that would have an allowance for relation to different animals that went beyond the register of disgust, that went beyond the register of, of just them suffering? Oh, they're, they're suffering. You know, no one, everyone agrees. No one should suffer. Find me the person who says, I want to see animals suffer. No one is going to say that. But what is the community that would allow for more of us to realize that? And I think that is a very difficult question because I think that most of the sort of didactic or polemic things that that you might say, that I might say, to encourage people to show more respect for and sympathy for and allowance for animals, they will agree with. I mean, who find me the person who says, I think factory farming is great. Let's have more of it. Let's put it everywhere. This is working out so well. You know, no, they say, of course, it's horrible. I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with it. Now, I'm, I am going to go eat a chicken sandwich, but that doesn't, you know, I, that's not a political position. It just is something that I happen to be doing, right? And I don't, you know, I think the challenge that you're setting up for yourself with, with this podcast and with your work and the challenge for so many of us is to find an effective and open space. And again, I don't know what it is, but to allow for more people to develop a concern that becomes a practice, you know, not just a, re a refle reflex of disgust or sympathy or what have you. And that's in, in a way, that's partly the intent. One of the reasons I like talking about sort of deep worldview stuff is because you can engage people honestly in these types of questions before they get scared off by the implications. Because as you say, you know, who would want to believe in things that aren't grounded in evidence and reason? Who who would withdraw compassion from every sentient being? Of course, all suffering matters. So it's quite interesting to engage people in that stuff and maybe even get some degree of intellectual commitment from them. And then we can layer in the implications and then the problems start. Um, but at the same time, it's also breathtakingly naive, right? Because in a way, you know, taking a naturalistic epistemology in a sentiocentric moral scope are quite obvious, and many people would agree with them. But, but the philosophy and even the science behind that is absolutely nowhere sufficient. The dark heart of the problem, as we'll come on to later, is in human psychology and social norms and political will and you know economic and political systems, and that's really where the work that needs to, you know, be done actually lies. It's not getting the agreement on these basic philosophical things at all. So that's therein lies the challenge, yeah. And so it was great to understand your sort of personal journey about that moral scope and who gets to be included as a valid other. Um, and that theme runs richly through Marks for Cats too, because some people seem to think animal ethics and animal rights was invented in the 1940s by, you know, Peter Singer and Richard Ryder, and they conveniently ignore many of the other people around them that contributed to that uh, deeply important work. Um, and I will often point out that, you know, these ideas have been around probably as long as humans and probably even longer than that. You know, non-human non animals care for each other in their own family, in their own group. And that's the rudiment of, of compassion. Yes, we might have formalized that and made that universal, but these ideas have been around probably longer than humans. And even when you look through different human cultures, ideas like ahimsa that runs through the Dharmic religions, or you'll find these themes in some of the African cultures or Aboriginal cultures, this idea of recognizing that non-human animals are, you know, agents and moral patients and, you know, they matter too, are deep and ancient ideas. And one of the fascinating things in Marx for Cats was that you could see those connections in some of the early parts of Marxist or leftist political thinking. There were some quite rich connections with the non-human animal topic, but those seem to have been lost. And I without going into my own politics, you know, I find that deeply frustrating because there are some people on the political spectrum where you could understand 
that they would brutally exclude non-human animals from moral consideration because they're very comfortable with casting other humans into outgroups and brutalizing and exploiting them, right? So there are certain parts of the political dynamic where it just fits. It's just another group to exploit and harm and, and even kill. But I guess I have a higher expectation of those more towards the center, certainly on the left, who are deeply connected with ideas like oppression and exploitation and solidarity and comradeship. And it seems starkly dissonant that those same people who feel these things emotionally and intellectually and have a deep commitment to, you know, rooting out the problems in the intrahuman space, can so unthinkingly, or it just doesn't even occur to them to think beyond the human. So I, I should stop ranting and rambling, but I'm, I'm fascinated to, if you could help us understand maybe some of those early connections where there was a more hopeful, you know, idea about going beyond the speed boundary and what's happened since. Absolutely. Yeah, the book, you know, Marks for Cats, it tries to collect a sort of series of of forgotten stories and forgotten histories in which uh, for better and worse, I mean it's it's not always a a happy story. I should stress that. But in which these these Social and political and economic alliances have been formed or have been attempted to be formed between human and non-human actors to to change and to interfere and to shape a political world. Um, and I, you know, I completely agree with you when you say one would hope that on the left, or you know, one would hope that in a political space where where what brings people together is a a longing for forms of freedom and self-development. There would be more of an opening towards including other species in those spaces. Um, I don't know that that's true, sad, sadly. I think that, you know, the people, when they see the book Works for Cats, they often ask me, well, is this a, is this a joke, right? Is, there, is it a joke? And I think in a way it is a joke. And I think in a way the joke is probably uh, 95, maybe 99, I don't know, a high percentage of Marxists. If you said we should include animals, non-human animals, and the political pantheon of those who are entitled to a, a, a freedom, a political freedom, a social freedom, an emotional freedom, they would laugh. They would say that's a joke. So... I sort of constructed the book in a way to say, look, you think it's a joke. I'll make it a joke. Like, you can tell us 1,200-year history about domestic and wild felines as political actors. And one of the things that this archive is meant to demonstrate as it accumulates century after century, continent after continent, political party after political party is one of the fundamentals of human reality has been the presence of non-human animals and the way that we imagine and intercept them and deal with them as members of our community. That said, you know, one of the things that I find so fascinating about the Middle Ages is that animals were absolutely considered economic and political actors and the consequence of which was far for good from them. You know, they would be, for instance, a pig who tacked and ate one of her piglets put on trial for infanticide. You know, a dog who who stole some meat put on trial and hung. I mean, that was a capital crime. A rat who broke into a grain depot and ate some grain put on trial. So Animals were, I mean, they were given counsel, like they really were considered juridical subjects, but, and and that shows that they were really taken seriously. I mean, they were really taken seriously as actors. What was the consequence for that? Well, do we want capital trials for dogs? I don't know. But it just shows the radical sense of difference and the radical sense of in which we might imagine what animals are doing in our world. Yeah. And, and those those instances strike me as a really weird situation because in a way there's a recognition of the agency of the animal absolutely but not really a recognition of the patience of the animal or other animals it's which is a pretty tough spot to be in <laughs> it, it is i mean that said you know 
plenty of humans were sent to Australia. You know, they were given penal transportation to Australia for stealing an egg or stealing a loaf of bread. I mean, so this is not a this is not a system of that there that there are a lot of allowances for poverty or for need. But you're right. They were absolutely treated with agency. And with the rise of capitalism, you know, really with the I mean, with the rise of the sort of nation states of democratic capitalism, you know, as a result of, let's say, the bourgeois revolutions, by the by the 18th century, really mid 18th century, animals have been sort of desacralized. I mean, sort of anything that was was agential, powerful, special about again for good and bad. You know, a witch putting a cat on trial for being a witch's accomplice is not great for the cat, but it does show that the cat has appreciable power. I mean, that has been sort of rendered mute. I mean, capitalism, it 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 desacralizes, it constructs something that we now know as nature. I'm not even sure that's the best term for what we're talking about. And then really by the 19th century, you have a division of, you know, you have the pet and those are the animals with whom you can have some companionship. Uh, and then you have working animals, and then you have animals as commodities, you know, farm animals, animals for meat and dairy production. But the sort of vestiges of radical animal otherness have been disappeared, right? And so part of what the book wants to do is resuscitate the possibility of a radical animal otherness as a kind of agency. Again, you know, this brings us to the question, well, okay, what would that actually look like? And I think we don't know because we don't yet have it, but it would not look like factory farms and it would not look like pet ownership. And I I made the comment before that one of the incredible things about, you know, studying history is you get to appreciate how much change is possible. Um, If you had told somebody 250 years ago that human pets would go to daycare centers and schools and and have their portraits taken and and really be considered, you know, like children and so on and so forth. I don't know that anybody would have believed you. It would have been thought of as so alien. And one of the questions I like to ask with Marks for Cats is, what will the presence of animals look like in in another 200 years? I mean, just as, as people 200 years ago couldn't imagine the the relationality to animals we have today, I don't think we can imagine what it could be, right? I mean, and that's that's a sense of openness and possibility that I, I, I really hope the book introduces by showing just how how much relationality with animals has been possible and is possible and has been sort of forcibly excluded from different leftist political archives. Yeah, thank you. And it's interesting because the way cats, as and, and one example, are used as symbols throughout economic and political history, in a way, is another form of objectification and and then usage. But the reason they're used is by definition because of a recognition of the nature of their agencies, right? Because it's because of their characteristics, because of what they're like that means that they're so powerful in those symbols. And I wonder if. I don't know what you think of this hypothesis, whether within Marxism, because the focus is very much on political economy and that system obviously has broader ramifications, but it's focused on political economy. And it's also focused quite hard on making a distinction within humanity between the workers, the proletariat and the capitalists as, you know, the oppressed and the oppressors. Whether the simplicity of that structure then made it harder to recognize non-human animals, partly because they were already assumed to just be products in the political economy, but also because they didn't necessarily fit into the oppressors oppressed classification of humans. And there just wasn't sort of space. Is it too much of a binary model to then allow other patients? It's a really interesting question, and I think we'd have to be careful how we, how we answer it. Because even as you were talking, I was thinking, okay, I can see where where we could look at Marks for Cats and find evidence of exactly what you're saying. So, for example, Rosa Luxemburg 
Polish Polish Marxist had a an absolutely intimate and comradely relationship with her cat Mimi. I mean, you know, debated taking the cat to prison with her, decided not to. Always included Mimi in her letters. You know, r- writes a letter, for example, where Lenin comes over to her apartment and they spend the afternoon playing with Mimi and they discuss what a sort of regal and majestic being she is. She was horribly criticized by her comrades for giving Mimi and giving cats meat. And and the criticism was, how could you give meat to these cats when so many humans are hungry? So I, in that sense, I can agree with what you're saying. Now, at other times, I think of the industrial workers of the world, the IWW, big labor union in the United States, very radical Much of the organizing came out of Chicago in the 1910s, and particularly 1910s and 1920s, but particularly the Chicago stockyards, the sort of animal killing facilities. And somebody like Upton Sinclair, who people might know wrote The Jungle, and it's a very gruesome description of of animal dismembering and of, of meat packaging. You know, he also rejected. And he has this letter in which he says, I refuse to consider that chickens and pigs are my brothers. And he meant that in a sense of socialism. But the reason he's writing that, the reason he's coming out against it is because many of the socialists and the radicals who organized with the IWW in the stockyards did start to see, you know, there is a connection between the brute force with which we as workers treat these animals and the brute force with which the owners of these factories treat us, right? And we are all in a gruesome scene. The animals are in a gruesome scene because they are suffering and we are killing them. And we are in a gruesome scene. We are suffering and we are killing them. So there's there's not a there's not an easy answer to the question. So yeah, I think there's there's not an easy answer to that that question. And I think, you know, one of the things that I do try to do in the book is show that there has for centuries been a sense of not necessarily Marxist, sometimes Marxist, sometimes leftist, but a liberatory current that moves between human political freedom and and the desire for animal political freedom that has, it's true, been ignored, been exiled, been quashed. It keeps coming back. There's a there's an absolute genealogy in com- compiling one of these stories after another. The book tries to say, you know, we if we value these archives together as a single conversation, then we can see that animal liberation and animal freedom has always been part of human political freedom and human political liberation. It just hasn't been valued consistently, but there has always been a conversation about it. I mean, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the queer and communist revolutions of the 20th century, you know, and the specter of animal liberation has been a sort of consistent interlocutor in in this problem and in this, this sort of sense of becoming. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's come on to the final crazily broad question about how we can make a better future. And you've already said, who knows what it's going to look like in 200 years. So uh, I feel a bit unfair sort of asking you for a grand utopian vision. But it would be interesting to talk about the, you know, the big picture stuff, you know, a vision of maybe an interspecies communism or what might the political economy look like if the resonances in these stories can be really brought back to the fore again and people can open their minds to that vision. What would that look like? And then maybe before we wrap up, we can talk about some of the more intimate relational questions. Uh, you talked about companion animals before. When we're thinking about the big picture of political economy, and I'm no specialist in this, on the one hand, people will defend capitalism and democracy by saying, look, They're about the things you care about. They're about freedom, you know, the freedom to consume, the freedom to produce, the freedom to vote. Often the the left-wing response to that is those things have been co-opted, right? Democracy has been co-opted by capitalism and capitalism itself provides maybe a shallow sense of freedom, but in a deep sense, it's oriented at enriching and concentrating power. So there's a challenge. But there's a, a worry about 
more left-leaning politics that the response in challenging capitalism and democracy is to head to something that feels much more authoritarian. And you talked in the book about, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat. And obviously history has plenty of examples of where that's ended up in terrible places and doesn't I mean it always has to. But I'm interested in one, your choice of a sort of central symbol, a cat. I don't think we put up with anti-authoritarianism. And part of the reason you chose them and they've been so resonant is because they're deeply anti-authoritarian, right? They're, they're not the sort of animal that would put up with authoritarianism. But how do you think in big terms about how we might be able to move towards the sort of political economy you're imagining without it falling into traps of authoritarianism or kleptocracy or some of the other issues that we've seen when people have tried these routes in the past? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, you're right. It's a it's a hard question to answer. It's a hard question to answer individually, especially for somebody interested in a, in traditions that privilege collectivity and collective actions. Now, I would say this should include animals, so that would be one answer. But I'll just give you know, in the in the spirit of a of a discreet podcast answer, I'll just give two suggestions. One, the end of factory farming, and two, the end of pet ownership. Let's just start with those. Easy to accomplish. We could probably make it happen tomorrow. Um, and let's just see what our imaginations and relations with animals as companions, as food, as commodities, as forms of either environmental destruction or environmental salvation would look like. If those two contemporary strictures, I do think they're strictures, right? They are absolute economic forces as well, pet ownership and factory farming. If they were to disappear, if we were to abolish those, how might we start again anew? So those would be two small suggestions, and they're very different, right? Again, I don't think anybody uh, is going to say, no, we have to keep factory farming. It's, it's working so well. But people will get very upset about pet ownership. They really will. They really will. But to me, these are two sides of the same coin. And one of the challenges when we talk, start talking about interspecies politics and um, uh, you know these ideas of sentientist democracy or sentiocracy or you know any any form of including non-human animals in our politics will be to say well you know how can we bring their perspectives into our politics because they you know they can't talk right mm -hmm. and and on the one hand you know that's that's a fair challenge and we should have some humility about it. But at the same time, your example of you know ending industrial farming, I think, is pretty well substantiated, right? Because we are evolved animals. Our most fundamental needs and interests actually echo very resonantly across, you know, the rest of the animal species. We don't like being constrained or abused or hurt or mutilated or having our families taken away. Or we don't like physical pain and we don't want to be killed, right? This is really obvious stuff, right? It doesn't need a PhD to work out that animals don't like that stuff. And that, I think, gives us enormous a, a moral imperative to do what you were saying, right? It's pretty obvious. In the, in the space of companion animals, people might challenge because they will talk about, well, if I, okay, I, I, I get what you're saying, Lee Claire and Jamie, we should genuinely take the perspective of the other. And, you know, the companion animal, cat and dog that share my home are part of my family, seem very happy and you know, so so what's the issue there? How have you come through writing this book to think differently about the companion animal or the pet animal? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, as I as I relate in the book and as I related to in this in this story, it was you know the book is in part dedicated to my cat. His name was the mitten who passed in 2016, and it was it was having a dream where he you know he invites me to think about his life and. The lives of other animals, which really to me was such a sort of intellectual turning point. And so I was genuinely surprised. And this is one of the incredible things about doing in depth research. You know, you surprise yourself and you change your own mind. And if someone had told me at the beginning of writing Marks for Cats, uh, by the end of this, you will have no desire to own a cat ever again. I don't think I would have believed you. I think I would have responded the way that you're now saying that interlocutors to be right might respond. Oh, but they're. My child, it's my family, and you know, I love them, I care for them, they're so happy. I think all of those things are true. I think people do genuinely love and care for their companion animals. 
I think in many cases they probably are happy, but it's it's the wrong relationship to to animals. It's 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 a relationship. You know, we talked about the sense of disgust. How no one's in favor of factory farming. Everyone will come out and say no one should suffer. It's horrible, so on and so forth. But the flip side of that is the overly sentimental attachment to a particular, whether it's a particular animal or a particular, you know, subject. And, you know, one of the reasons Marx himself was against anti-vivisection societies and he was against the kind of anti-animal cruelty societies that had begun to spring up in the late 19th century, particularly in late Victorian England, was he thought, you know, this is just another case of bourgeois moralism, right? Like, I'll take care of my own cat. What do I care if the world is over one with feral cats? They're not my cat. You know, I'll take care of this one, you know, poor street urchin. What do I care if my factory is filled with poor street urchins? Right. So it's like a narrow, performative, very selective. It's a privileging of the individual over the structure that produces that instance of individualism, right? And I've just seen, I've just seen too, I've just, I've seen it too many times. I mean, even my own family who like, they genuinely love their animals, but they also genuinely love to eat other animals. That it's, it's not only that there's a contradiction. I don't have so much of a problem with that, but I've actually come to think that, that pet ownership or pet, pet relationality actually inhibits an ability to form other kinds of relationships with animals to whom we don't live in proximity or animals that are not ours, you know, that we don't own, that we don't care for in an intimate way. So I love animals. I love being in a community with them. You know, I can imagine a cat, a dog, whomever making the decision to join or not join certain human households. But but I really do think that the the pet ownership construct and the pet ownership industry, I mean, it, it it really is part and parcel of industrial animal agriculture. That's fascinating because it's because I think many people would say, isn't the companion animal thing a way into exactly. a better ethics for non-human animals? Because at least that human has gone beyond the species boundary and they care about some animals, and then you can challenge the hypocrisy and then you can take them on. And and your suggestion I'm is saying it's working no. the other way around. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's actually an impediment. And it's, I think it's very, it's very rare. I think you and maybe your, you know, your listeners can count on one hand, maybe you don't even need one hand at a time when pointing out someone's hypocrisy to them has motivated a change. You know, we're all hypocrites in our own way. I probably contradict myself 10 times before I even finish my morning coffee. And so being pointed at, you know, having someone point this out to you or even realizing it yourself, I I don't think that's enough. I know I don't know what is enough. That's I think that's the work that you're trying to do. That's the work that Marks for Cats is trying to do. I know you had Troy Viteze on your podcast. That's the work that he and his author are trying to do and have for socialism. So there are many different approaches. And I don't know which we need. We probably need all of them. We need many more. Let's just, you know, let's just remember the COVID-19 pandemic and and the the role of industrial animal agriculture in that. Who, whose mind did it change? You know, okay, it, it that that doesn't seem to be the mechanism for involvement in a larger species community. And I mean, again, I don't know what is, but but it doesn't seem to be pointing out hypocrisy. And I don't think it's I don't think it's pet ownership. I really I really don't. I mean, I'm happy to be proven wrong, um, but I don't. And certainly for me, the case was in fact the opposite. Learning this history writing this book, putting together this archive has has really turned me away from that. Not that I don't, again, love and value animals as members of a community, but I don't want to be involved in the pet ownership community. I want to find a different community. And I don't know if this resonates, but I wonder if it's by, by creating the companion animal category, it enables people to still say, I care about animals. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does, and they do. And they, they do. do. Yeah, yeah. They do. But the creation of that category, by definition, is ex- yes. brutally selective. Whereas, if that category didn't exist, yes, and then you said you care about animals, what the would it look like? What where would that the mean? Differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you said it better than I did. So I, I thank you for that. Yeah. 
Thank you. It's good I understood. Yeah. So overall, how does that leave you feeling in terms of the dynamics, particularly in the political left? Because do you think that things are shifting and can shift? You know, I, I've spoken to people like John Samuel Matsu and Troy Viteze and yourself, and, and there are some really powerful voices doing distinctive work that feels like they might have a chance at shifting stuff. And then you've got the wider societal dynamics about thinking about non-human animals. You've got the self-interested reasons about environment and zoonosis and pollution and land use and so on. So it, I have this naive optimism that maybe all of these different pressures would sort of build up and we will find a way to break through to imagining the sort of future that you'd like to see. What, how do you feel? You know, I, I, we, you made a comment in, in the early part of our conversation where you were sort of talking about what philosophical contingencies and what is the element of randomness and and what is the element of actual causality. I actually think the element of randomness in aesthetics, in human aesthetics, and I mean that in a sort of Kantian sense of what what a sensory impression does to us and how it allows us to elaborate certain things is quite random. And I think that the taste for for meat, the ta- I mean, the taste for animal fat and animal muscle, so it's, you know, dairy and, and eggs and meat, I think is is random. I think that there's there's nothing essential about it. I If it all disappeared and we had all plant-based food products, we would have just as many and just as enjoyable and just as intense tastes. And, and so... You know, there there's so many historical examples of radical and revolutionary social overturnings of forms of economy, of forms of government, of forms of comportment. Um, so I do feel very I feel very optimistic about it. I feel very excited about it. As an academic, I feel, you know, as a professor, I I feel that so much of the really creative work that is being done by professional thinkers, you know, academics, is in the realm of animal studies. And so that feels very, very exciting to me. Do I think it's going to be tomorrow? Do I think it's going to be next year? No. You know, I mentioned, I think before we started recording that I had, I just got back this year. I lived in Berlin, Germany for the last two years. And, you know, Germany, my God, I mean, there's a land of of pork and and butter, if ever there was one. Berlin now is like one of the vegan capitals of the world. The rubric for understanding it is not animal rights or animal cruelty. It's much more environmental. It's much more like, you know, try not to fly as much, ride your bike instead of drive your car, and eat less animal products. Like, so I feel very excited about it. And and you know, if if Germany can change, if they can if they can give up pork. I think, I think so many people can, but I, but it's a process. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. It's been absolutely fascinating, but to read oh, the book and to the privilege to get the chance to talk to you. Thank you. So is there anything else you want to add into the conversation? Because we've, we've answered what's real, who matters and how to make a better future all in one go. I think that's pretty good. No, I just want to thank you not only for our conversation, but for your larger project. This has been a joy to learn about, and I look forward to more conversations, both with you and your other, your other guests. Thank you. I think we have about 7.8 billion more humans to persuade, but I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> I'm sure YouTube and podcast and Facebook groups will do it. But it's yes. Just a process. Just a process. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. Thank you so much. And what's the best way of people buying the book, following your work more broadly? You know, how much of a social media fan are you? Yeah, I do Twitter. I do, you can follow me at Marks for Cats. On Instagram, I do cat only, cat only Instagram account, Marks for Cats. But that's, you know, cats in politics, cats in history, cats in radical revolutionary scenarios. So that's very much Marxist cats or socialist cats. Uh, Twitter, it's all of it. And the book, yeah, you could buy it at Duke University Press's website or, you know, it's been distributed. I think it's it's all over. I think it'll be coming out in Italian and Thai uh, in translation as well. So, I'm, oh, cool. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see it. Um sort of make its way around the world. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I have a new book coming out next year uh, called Fake Work, uh, which is more about capitalism, less about uh, animals. Um, but I think it'll be a good read regardless. Based on your experience of being within the capitalist monster. 
Well, I'm still within the capitalist monster, but that was a very unique one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man- yeah, management consulting, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you. It's been a real inspiration to talk to you. Please do stay in touch and thank you for being a guest on Sentientism. Thanks so much, Jamie. Nice to talk to you as well. Yeah, cheers, Lee Claire.